Good afternoon from, from uh, Lisbon, Portugal. It's Dr. John Bennett with another episode of the AFAN uh, regular presentations uh, on the channel of AFAN. Uh, first, let me uh, introduce Ulrich, who put this together, and he'll take over. Hello, Ulrich. Hello, Dr. Bennett. Thanks. Um, so, um, hello, everyone. I'm Ulrich Sidney. I'm a research associate at the Programming Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Um, today, we're going to be um, hosting Dr. Fraser Henderson, who's a neurosurgical resident. He's going to present himself. So, before we get to Dr. Henderson, um, can you present yourself, uh, Stefan? Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Fraser Henderson, Jr. And I'm a sixth year resident at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, uh, which fortunately just escaped, uh, escaped the hurricane. Um, I'm currently spending a few months up at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh, learning a little bit more about neurosurgical oncology. Uh, that's a particular interest. Uh, and I uh, was very happy to get your email a few weeks ago. Um, with the idea to have a little bit of a discussion about uh, neurosurgery in low and middle income countries, uh, at particularly functional. Uh, but uh, I thought we could begin today with a little bit of a discussion, um, in part for my own benefit, uh, see uh, as the needs and what you all have experienced in your training so far. Well, thank you very much. Um, so um, we're going to have a few of the panelists present themselves as well. So Stefan Gembu, can you present yourself? Okay. Hi everyone. Hi, I'm Stefan Gembu. I'm a general practitioner in Cameroon. I'm a member of AFEN, aspiring neurosurgeon. I really like to, to be with you, Dr. Further. I hope I will you really enjoy the presentation. And this is a great opportunity. Thank you for you for your time. And I'm waiting for the presentation. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thanks, thanks, um, Stefan. So, Zolo Ivan, can you present yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I am uh, Zolo Ivan. I am a fifth year medical student from the University of Boya in Cameroon. I am happy to be here. I'm excited. So, um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kabulo. Thank you. My name is Kabulo. I'm from Democratic Republic of Congo. Currently, I'm a final year neurosurgery resident at the University of Zimbabwe. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Agustino Jacinto, can you present yourself, please? Uh, I am uh, Augusto Jacinto Mocindo Alberto. I am a resident of second year in Mozambique, Mapud Central Hospital. Thank you so much. Um, Shivrag. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Actually, I'm Dr. Chirak Swalanki. I'm from India. And uh, I was interested in this topic, especially the function neurosurgery stuff in uh, uh, lower resource settings, uh, because I'm from India. And presently, I've come, I, I'm a consultant neurosurgeon in India. And I've come here in UK, Oxford, uh, John Radcliffe Hospital for uh, fellowship in uh, functional neurosurgery. So that is going to be a quite interesting uh, talk. Project. Yes. Oh, thank you so and much. Nice to meet you all. Uh, yeah. Uh, please, please, Dr. Shirai, um, um, contribute as much as you can. We would love to learn from sure, you. Sure. Uh, and if you yeah, yeah, if you sure. have some time, I mean, even later down the road, we can always program like a presentation. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thank you so much. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. My pleasure. Uh, we've all gotten to meet each other now. I'm going to I'm going to start with a little. Uh, presentation because um, Dr. Henderson wanted me to uh, get a presentation of what we have now in terms of neurosurgery. And um, it's going to be uh, just on neurosurgery in general with a little bit of emphasis in like um, uh, Cameroon as well as uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo perhaps. So. The idea today is to give an, uh, a sort of a brief overview of what neurosurgery is like in Africa today and perhaps project ourselves into the future. So uh, medical schools in, in Africa right now 
offer very little exposure to neurosurgical practice uh, conventionally. So when students get exposure, usually it's um, mostly out of interest and maybe knowing like um, having the connections to help them. So it's not classical to get neurosurgical practice during the training. Um, Due to the fact that there are very few neurosurgeons around the continent, there are equally few mentors and role models because it's, it's always easier to aspire to become something you've seen before, someone that looks like you that's um, done it before. And unfortunately, we know that um, there are very few neurosurgeons uh, on the continent at the moment. Um, there are few conferences as well, few information, very little information for aspiring neurosurgeons. So it feels like it's almost impossible to get into neurosurgery, let alone functional neurosurgery. And then another problem is the misconceptions about neurosurgery. The few that have heard about neurosurgery have heard about um, the very grave uh, postoperative outcomes, usually with the um, brain operations, the cost of surgery, which is believed to be exorbitant, and cultural beliefs, because people still believe that um, an operation on the brain is something very extraordinary and that you can't uh, recover from that. So about the training, at the moment on the continent, the options are divided into WFNS sponsored training and the non WFNS sponsored training. So, for the WFNS sponsored training, um, WFNS recognized the fact that there are very few neurosurgeons on the continent and try to help to uh, increase these numbers. So, at the moment, um, we have these different centers. The idea is these are centers that have been training for a while. So, WFNS basically pays for the training of neurosurgery residents and uh, gives them stipends so that they can uh, do their training on the continent because the idea is if you train this, the, the, the neurosurgeons on the continent, they're more likely to stay. They won't leave um, uh, to other countries abroad. Um, at the moment, things have been really good. There's a great core coming out of Rabat, Rabat Training Center. Quite a few uh, famous neurosurgeons there, like Dr. Claire Garikesi, who's like the first female neurosurgeon from, from Rwanda. And these other centers have, um, have joined the coup. Now, there's a particular example here that's a bit different. It's the China-Africa training program headed by Professor Mahmoud Qureshi in Kenya. So the program uh, works with 19 particip participating centers in China. And um, candidates uh, go to these centers in China and receive a, a stipend of about um, five, a little less than $500. They get accommodation, living expenses for one person. You can't go with your family. And the training is four years. The other training on the continent in the other WFNS um, training centers is five years. So this is another option. Uh, on the other side, we have non-WFNS sponsored training. So uh, these are ones that you need to apply to and usually have to pay. The very cheap options at the moment are the WAX and COSEXA. So WAX is the West African College of Surgeons. Um, based in Nigeria, but it takes um, the West African region. And then you have COSEXA. COSEXA is the College of Southern, Eastern, Central um, uh, African uh, Surgical Society. Uh, COSEXA has done a great job of training a, a few batches of um, neurosurgery residents. In the case of COSEXA, you do, um, first of all, two years of like general surgical practice, then six years, so altogether it's eight. So there's like a, there's a really great disparity in terms of training programs available out there. As you have noticed, you can go from four years in China through the WFNS to eight years to Texas. Um, other countries have national training programs. I basically took the list of those which are uh, the most reputable on the continent at the moment uh, with varying admission uh, condition, conditions. So uh, particular emphasis on two countries. The DRC, I wouldn't put uh, uh, a slide here because there's no program currently in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So Cameron, how do you do that? Um, once you finish the long path of medical school, so you, you need to um, start a new one, which is basically getting into residency. There's two options that you have, Enterna and Residana. Uh, there's huge differences. Enterna, you, because in Cameroon, medical school is seven years. So to get into antenna, you can basically get there after your sixth year. So while your cohort is in its seventh year, you're in your first year of um, residency. So antenna gives you that option. Um, usually they are more of academicians, they do more of research. Um, so it's a bit time saving in terms of like it's early, but 
uh, financially, they're not covered. So it's a bit of an issue for those who get into that. And it's a relatively new specialty program. So we're not quite sure where that will lead. Um, the other option is Residana. Now, to get into Residana, you need at least two years experience. So once you finish your seventh year of medical school, you have two years on the ground, then you can apply for Residana. And when you get into Residana, you have the financial coverage. And it's a little bit longer because if you calculate two people from the same cohort, medical school cohort, they'd have about four years difference. Um, now, go, coming to a team um, from the present to the future, the problem, as we see it, as we stated, on the continent, there are very few neurosurgeons. And while we're increasing that, the thing is the early career neurosurgeons usually have to come back and build everything from scratch. So you have to do more than just neurosurgery. Um, you come back to, on a, to your country, for example, and uh, you have got all these cases. You've got trauma, you've got spine, pediatrics, um, two more cases as well. Um, these are the usual ones. But then the limitations usually are uh, radiation oncology, vascular, um, functional neurosurgery, uh, you, uh, the use of microscopes and endoscopes. And you usually get affected to, in most sub-Saharan African countries, you get sent to a hospital that doesn't have anything. So you have to look for financing, equipment, human resources. You need people who can help you with imaging, neuro ICU, pathology. Um, and so the definition of the future African neurosurgeon is not just that person who has the skills, the skill sets for the operation. So this person above all has to be a leader. You have to be a leader because there's no way you're going to have um, good operative outcomes if you don't have um, good anesthesia with ICU, if you don't have proper uh, neuroradiology. And for that, then you have to surround yourself with the right people. You have to help people to train as well. So one of the groups of our, one of the objectives of our group is not just to help future neurosurgeons, but it's to help connect or, um, other forms of um, professions, be it neuro ICU, neuroradiology, because we understand that we cannot work without them. So idea is as future African neurosurgeons, we have to get some management skills, financing, because you will have usually to buy everything for your department or service. Surgical technique innovation, we need to redefine things for ourselves. We cannot just do a blatant copy and paste from high income countries. Um, same goes for equipments and develop our own uh, evidence based, context specific guidelines. Thank you. So um, now we're going to speak with um, Dr. F Dr. Henderson. It's okay. Hopefully, it was just temporary. Go ahead, Wilmer. Uh, Dr. Henderson is muted. I think he wanted to, to give a comment. Oh, okay. Can you unmute him, John? Please? Yeah, I am. I think, nice. I think you can hear me now, right? Yes. And can you see my screen? Uh, no, your screen not yet. Uh, let's see, Dr. Bennett, is there a way to share that? Yeah, yeah uh, okay, click on the screen. share button at the bottom. Go ahead, Ulrich, lead him through. So uh, at the bottom of your, of your screen, what the little exercise we did at the beginning, just click on share screen and click on the screen you want to share. That should be okay. It's like a rectangular button with the with narrow on it. See, it's not uh... mm. um, maybe what we can do is um, did you want to share the yeah. screen with like um, yeah or uh, can you bring articles up... I can yeah I can bring up the articles can yeah. you bring up the okay. first article uh, what is neurosurgery Yes, yes. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to bring this set of articles to your attention. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you've already seen them, published in the Red Journal recently this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with them? 
Yes, yes, yes. The essentials for uh, essential neurosurgery for medical students. Very, very good um, publication. Yes, and it's you know it's openly accessible uh, to anyone mm -hmm. uh, to download. Uh, some of the chapters are a little bit dense, uh, so um, you know more than we can discuss in one chapter. But I thought it's worth beginning from the beginning uh, and just to reiterate what it is we're talking about. Um, you know, we are talking about uh, the best field in medicine, uh, neurosurgery. And uh, it's also important though, like you said, said that to remember that and the, the setting is, um, some things are gonna be universal and some things are gonna be di distinct to the region. And uh, I think that was a great point that you made about uh, the importance of not simply copying and pasting what's done in one country to do in another country, because uh, that would be a disservice. Um, neurosurgery is, is you know, one of the newest fields, and uh, there's some great books uh, on the field. If anybody would like any recommendations on the history of neurosurgery, I'd be happy to send them to you. Uh, and I think you already mentioned in your introduction how diverse the field is. Uh, Neurosurgery is not just, in today's world, it's, it's more than one man can or woman can master. There is pediatric, spine, neuroendovascular, cerebrovascular, skull base, neuro-oncology, peripheral nerve, trauma, and functional. And in residency, we get exposure to all of these, um, but generally, uh, over the course of practice, uh, people tend to uh, you know, develop expertise in certain areas, of which functional is, is one. Um, and uh, before we talk about that, I thought it was also worthwhile to, to bring up this article on what makes a good neurosurgery resident. Do you, do you have that? Yes, yes. Uh, and um, can the, um, yeah. Um, I think uh, in many ways you're more familiar with some of the online resources than I am, uh, and I'm certain that you're aware of uh, all of the resources on Neurosurgical Atlas. Yeah. Um, but, but before your audience and students and uh, residents get too excited about a particular sub area of neurosurgery, uh, you have to remember that the foundation is um, more on, there's a very important foundation you have to begin with. Um, and these are the qualities of a good neurosurgical resident. And I think these fall into the category of things that are universal, that should be universal, this, no matter what country you're in or what resource setting you're in. Um, they are things uh, like trustworthiness, efficiency, independent learning, strong work ethic, attention to detail, and personability, uh, all of which, in fact, you, you seem exemplified by putting this type of thing together. So I, I really congratulate you on, on doing that. Uh, that takes a lot of initiative. Um, do, does any audience have any um, perspectives from other countries? Uh, perhaps the Indian trained neurosurgeon, um, does, see from, would he uh, agree that uh, these qualities are, are the uh, foundation of any neurosurgical learning? Dr. Shirag? Dr. Shirag, um, if, you, if you're listening, we'd like to know what you think are the qualities of a good neurosurgery resident. Or oh, maybe he stepped away. We have Dr. Kabulu. We have Dr. Kabulu who can give a perspective from like Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, that, Dr. Kabulu, that would be great. Yeah. What would you say is the, uh, are the qualities of a good neurosurgery resident? Yeah, and, and have you seen any examples of good or bad in your, in your experience? Hello, Dr. Kabula, are you there? Whoop, whoop. People are stepping away here. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, we can go on. I think they'll come back probably. Okay. It's not easy. They're probably at work, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't think you can over emphasize these things, uh, particularly because 
uh, in many of your countries, uh, you are the pioneers in a way that I, I can never be such a play such a role in my country because uh, uh, there's already a longer history in them. Um, but you all have a tremendous uh, responsibility to establish the the foundation for the next century of African neurosurgeons to to understand the importance uh, of um, these qualities. Uh, because if you don't have them, it, it's not worth starting probably. Um, and then, uh, of course, professionalism and leadership, uh, all of which you mentioned. So, um, the, um, and then it's worth you know, noting uh, the common points of failure. Uh, common points of failure in neurosurgery residency are dishonesty, poor medical knowledge, inadequate technical skill, or sense of entitlement. And uh, all of these, and um, uh, if, uh, if these creep into your training, then you're no longer doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is taking care of patients. Yeah. Uh, so um, perhaps uh, what I can do is share a little bit of a, a slideshow uh, that I have on on uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, would that, that be helpful? Or, or yes, does anybody have experience with functional neurosurgery in low-income settings? You, you should go ahead, um, Dr. Henderson. Go yeah. ahead and, okay. yeah. Uh, here we go. Okay, I think I... Don't worry, Doc, this is new tech for all of us. Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. So Anderson, can, yes, um, uh, Dr. Chirag re um, replied to, to the question. I think he's not able to, to speak at the moment. So he said, um, yes, very true. I have gone through the same article. What I think um, that you learned during the residency is the foundation. And during your practice, you build upon that. So all these qualities are very important to nurture these qualities, um, are very important, and it's important to nurture these qualities during residency. Good. Well, um, these are a few slides that I presented at um, my program a few months ago, beginning with a case of a 34-year-old <clears throat> woman who presented with increasing frequency of seizures, and they've been going on for four years and happened about two times per week. Uh, she was taking uh, two medications, uh, but still still have a frequency uh, when she was examined in the clinic, she was neurologically intact. Uh, what, what would happen to this patient in Cameroon? Um, so unfortunately, we don't have um, functional neurosurgery. So uh, it, it would be one of two options. Either we change anti-epileptics, increase them, or on the other side, if the patient has money, if the patient has money, the patient will have to travel to get okay. functional neurosurgery. Would they go to North Africa or South Africa or? Um, usually, it it's not the South, but that usually depends on uh, the connections of the neurosurgeon. Because okay. if the neurosurgeon, for example, trained in Morocco, they're more likely to send a person to Morocco. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, this uh, leads to a question. Uh, what is the most common brain abnormality underlying temporal lobe epilepsy? Uh, um, mesial, mesial temporal sclerosis. Perfect, perfect. And uh, so, you know, in the U.S., then they would undergo neuropsychological testing. Uh, what types of deficits in memory would, might you see? Um, that should be... Retrograde, um, anterograde, if like it's uh, touching the amygdala, amygdalum. And can you see the options here? Uh, we're going with uh, verbal. No, so all, all we all we can see at the moment is um, uh, a, fa a, fa a file, neurosurgery and NMICs, and you selected the PowerPoint, but it's not yet open. Oh, um, I'm sorry, it's showing on my screen. Um, I'm 
Don't Is worry, Tom. We, we can edit oh, yes. this out. Yes, perfect. This out. There perfect. we go. And uh, can you see the whole screen? Yes. Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay. Here, sorry, here is the um, introduction slide. Um, mm. And um, discussing how the sword may be mightier than the pen. And here is our, our patient, a 34-year-old woman with increasing seizures. Here you correctly uh, identify that without any prompting. And um, uh, so in, in America, um, this is a huge problem. A million people with drug-resistant epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, in low- and middle-income countries, this number is going to be even, even larger. And the, the exciting thing for neurosurgery is that uh, many of these people are probably surgical candidates. Um, so, uh, you know, in our system, uh, everybody will get a very high detail MRI scan. Uh, is anybody in the audience familiar with uh, signs that might indicate mesial temporal sclerosis? Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I think it's, oh yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, look for the ipsilateral temporal horn. Um, how about um, clues based on the appearance of the seizures? Um, you can look for visual auras, uh, pay attention to the descriptions of deja vu or epigastric sensations, look and see whether speech is preserved during these episodes. Uh, there are a lot of clinical things that a good clinician can pick up that will direct you towards the correct um, origin of the seizures. Um, in mesial temporal sclerosis has a very classic clinical presentation of auras um, that uh, go back to the description in the Victorian period in England by Hewings Jackson, uh, a very famous English neurologist. He was the portrait on the first slide. And he published a, an account of a patient who was actually a doctor himself. And uh, many of these qualities, uh, this remains one of the best descriptions today of seizures from medial temporal sclerosis. Um, and uh, you can find this paper online. Um, just for the, for the audience, uh, seizure by seizure, we're talking about synchronized neural circuitry that combines with some kind of hyperexcitability uh, as a result of dysfunctional inhibitor circuits surrounding that. Uh, epilepsy can be defined in different ways, but um, generally, we think of an enduring alteration in the brain uh, that increases the likelihood of future seizures. Um, there are many types that are, we could, dis we could spend hours discussing all of this, um, but uh, we'll keep moving. Epilepsy can come from, from many things. Have you seen any of these in your rotations or experience in Africa? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, definitely cryptogenic uh, infections as well, brain injury, a few vascular malformations, postcraniotomy, uh, neoplasia. Uh, I've never seen tuberous sclerosis, so I'll, I'll, I think the more experienced probably seen it. Um, so Dr. Chirac says he's seen all of them. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so th this is, um, to your point, um, you know, the temptation is to add additional anti-epileptic drugs when people have persistent seizures. But uh, unfortunately, there is a rapidly decreasing marginal efficacy. With the first, you may get 50% control. With a second agent, you may catch an additional 15% of the people. Uh, but then with a third, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to help the seizure problem. Um, is, is that uh, data familiar to you? Uh, no, I wasn't familiar with uh, help. I wasn't familiar with that. And uh, this is important because um, seizure medicines are not without, um, without drawbacks. Uh, have you seen somebody who's been on a lot of seizure medication before? Um, yeah, yeah. They, um, uh, quite a few patients come that they have like a dull, they've dulled down in terms of uh, intellectual abilities. 
Yes. And not, not even to speak of the cost and expense and complication. And, um, um, so uh, let's go back to our patient here. Um, she described a, a deja vu. Um, when she has these seizures, uh, she would demonstrate some automatisms and um, her semiology was consistent with the mesial temporal sclerosis. Uh, she underwent uh, EEG. Is EEG available in uh, many centers in Africa right now? Not in many centers. In the regional hospitals, you, you can have EEGs. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, again, we could spend hours talking about um, epilepsy monitoring and interpretation of EEG, but... Uh, as you can see, begin to see, there, there are many parts of the workup that go into effective treatment uh, of these functional cases. Um, MRI findings. Um, so in, in the temporal lobe epilepsy, you want to pay particular attention to uh, the temporal horn or the hippocampal region. Uh, look for clues of any kind of asymmetry. Uh, that can help you hone in on the diagnosis. Um, there is other imaging used at some centers, uh, but it's not universally employed in the U.S. And uh, obviously, things like PET imaging are probably you know, very prohibitive in some of the countries. Uh, but even with the very best imaging, 90% of adult patients may have no obvious findings. Uh, so um, this is a patient that we treated uh, in South Carolina who happened to have, um, who happened, did happen to have an interesting finding of uh, a bit of herniation of the temporal lobe through a defect in the skull base. Um, so in, in the North American practice, which of the following would be considered essential before undertaking surgical section of an epileptogenic focus? Anybody in the group want to weigh in? Well, as you mentioned before, there's not many places that have all these studies, correct, uh, Ulrich? That only the larger cities? Uh, um, yeah, but, but the question is about like in North American context, definitely you need to you need to have neuropsychology and a functional MRI. Okay, man, you're you're good, you're good. Um, so, um, you know, this is a whole field outside of neurosurgery, uh, you know, who we've got to collaborate with. And uh, as you said, um, in the you know, when you go and try to build a neurosurgery program, it's not simply enough to be well-trained as an individual. Uh, you need to be a leader who can uh, develop a team with which to collaborate. Um, these were some findings from the neuropsychology assessment. Okay, so, um, you know, in our system, uh, next we would move towards a stereotactic EEG lead placement to get more information about where the seizures are coming from. Um, and we would put uh, monitoring leads into a series of locations. Uh, this is an example of, um, of a, kind of an ensemble of recording sites. And then after surgery, we would make sure that we put the monitoring leads in the correct place. Um, and we would give them antibiotics so they don't get infected through it and consult neurology to help wean the patient off their seizure medications to provoke seizures so that we could record them and uh, try and figure out what part of the brain is causing, causing the seizures. Is this a procedure you've ever seen? Uh, no, unfortunately, no. No. no way. Um, uh, it's probably where are you right now? Is that fair to say? 
he, so, he may be off. Yeah. No, no. He, he said um, he said he's in a he's in a, a public space, so he can't speak. So what he does is he types responses. Okay. So his his reply is yes. Um, he's seen uh, invasive monitoring. Yes. Um, is uh, you know do you, how do you think this is done in any centers right now in Africa? Uh, I think in South Africa in, and Morocco, um, they do that because um, uh, I think in Morocco is Professor Adil Malawi. He does that. He, he, he does this um, uh, invasive monitoring. But I don't know about any other centers. And so to your earlier point, um, um, you know, in trying to take care of these patients in the low and middle income countries, lower resource settings, uh, it's going to be necessary to develop uh, regional pathways for working this stuff up. Um, because this is, this is even prohibited for many, many North American hospitals, you know, do not have the capability to do all of these surgeries that can make such a dramatic difference in the patient's lives. Um, just to take a, Pause here. Uh, how are we doing on time? Don't, don't worry about time. Don't worry about time. We're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're good. Um, so um, I guess I, I brushed through it, but basically we will watch these patients in the hospital uh, until they have enough seizures to give us a good, good idea of whether we think the seizures are coming from the discrete region of the brain that would be resectable or from uh, what you would call an eloquent area of the brain, which even if we knew they were coming from that specific area, resecting that part of the brain would, would be considered uh, impossible because it would give the patient deficits that, that are unacceptable. Uh, I think. Someone has a comment. Julian EG, EG has lies the origin of seizures. I'm asking about invasive monitoring. Yes. Uh, and why? Well, I think we just I think we just answered that. Um, um, so so this particular patient, um, we were able to correlate the seizures from that left temporal tip uh, encephalocele. And um, so before going to surgery though, it's important to know a little bit of how the patient's brain is organized because um, uh, we do not all have the same localization you know, within our brains. Um, so you mentioned functional MRI earlier as uh, one way of doing that. Um, another option is something called the water test. Um, is, is that a test that you've seen? No, no, but uh, I read I read it in the uh, in the functional um, neurosurgery chapter. Yeah, um, a water test is a is a fairly old procedure where you inject um, a medication through the through one hemisphere of the brain through a carotid artery, and it basically um, puts that side of the brain to sleep for a short period of time and allows you to test what would happen if that, if that hemisphere were taken out of the cir circuit for a little bit, but it's uh, temporary. And uh, if it turns out that that hemisphere is your dominant hemisphere, there's no permanent uh, damage from the test, but it, it means that surgery is going to be much, uh, maybe more challenging or, or may have some more risks. Uh, I think somebody made a comment here. Um, yeah, it was Dr. Chirac saying the water test um, had been ab abandoned by quite a few centers. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Um, you know, here where I'm spending a few months, uh, they they just use the functional MRI. Is that is that what they use in his practice? We'll have to wait while he's typing okay. the response. Yeah. It takes a while to get the response. Oh yeah, he's, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and it depends a little bit on the availability and accessibility of endovascular surgeons who can do the test, as well as neurologists to, to perform the, um, the bedside tasks while the patient is undergoing the test. Um, so there, there's a couple of tricks to doing it, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's done pretty commonly and safely as long as you know a couple of things to look out for. Um, yeah, uh, some vascular anomalies can make the test risky uh, if you have something like a persistent primitive uh, trigeminal artery and don't recognize that. So, um, um, the the downside of functional MRI in relation to WADA is that um, functional tells you what part of the brain is activating during like a task at that moment. Um, but we know that the brain has some compensatory mechanisms such that if one part of a brain network is out, sometimes other, other networks or other nodes jump in to support that same function. Um, so um, even if one side of the brain were to be activated in a functional MRI with uh, higher blood flow and it's recognized on the scan, it, it doesn't mean that you can't live or perform that same function without that part of the brain. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so, uh, so basically, what the functional MRI shows you from what you're saying is like, wood does work, but it doesn't tell you what will, what will take care of things if the other wasn't capable of taking care of those things. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so it might, might make you feel like surgery is not possible or not safe when in fact you may have bilateral representation of some of those important language memory areas. And one side can simply take over the work of the other if, if it had to be resected in surgery. Okay, okay. Um, um, so um, um, obviously, um, before surgery, we talk to patients and go through an extensive consent process. Um, that's a very important thing in, in um, you know, in, in you know, uh, North American neurosurgery, uh, is setting expectations for the patients. Um, um, uh, during the consent process, you know, we also have to talk about other surgical strategies. Um, and discuss the risks and complications. Um, uh, Engel's classification is something we use to evaluate the success. Um, and um, this slide shows a little bit of, of what I showed earlier and uh, why surgery, functional neurosurgery may have tremendous benefit uh, for patients with epilepsy. What you can see here is that about 50% get their seizures free with one anti-epileptic drug, only 13% more with the second, 1% with the third. I think I quoted 4% earlier than that, but obviously it's going to be different numbers. So um, uh, I, think, uh, I think we've got to figure out a way to offer some of these, some of these surgeries in, uh, in the low and middle income countries because there may not be a better option right now. Um, um, the, this is a very good study that I recommend if you haven't read. Um, one of the best randomized trials published in the field of neurosurgery. Uh, have you seen it before? Um, no, but um, I'll take a look. We will all take a look and we'll <laughs> Yeah. Um, as, as you know, uh, Neurosurgery is a field in which there's still a lot of art, and uh, a lot of questions are very difficult to answer with a randomized controlled trial. Uh, but fortunately, uh, this question was addressed in this beautiful study 18 years ago uh, by Weeby et al. Uh, they looked at patients at least 16 years old who had seizures with the temporal lobe semiology, uh, who were having seizures despite at least two drugs. Um, they went through the assessment that I briefly discussed with you, and uh, 
uh, they performed surgery, uh, randomized to surgery or, or uh, non-surgery. And in surgery, uh, they resected about six centimeters on the non-dominant side and about four centimeters on the dominant side. Do you know, and when I say dominant or non-dominant, do you know kind of what functions I'm referring to? Um, yeah, um, it's about speech because we need yeah. to, to, to avoid um, uh, damaging the speech areas in the temporal lobe. Exactly. And typically they're more prominent on, the, on a dominant side and a little bit more anterior uh, on the dominant side. So it's possible to remove more of the temporal lobe on a non-dominant side without any, without any immediately noticeable deficit. But on the dominant side, as determined by your WADA or functional MRI, uh, you generally have to be a, a bit more cautious. Um, th these uh, types of surgery are great surgeries for learning and reviewing anatomy. Um, here's what we're talking about as far as that four centimeter and six centimeter. And um, on the dominant side, you're more likely to have some, begin to have some speech deficits if you extend your resection past that point. Uh, in Zimbabwe, yes. Um, in Cameroon, not yet. Uh, DRC, not. So that's another thing we need to we, we, we need to try and work out with. But we, we've had um, a neurosurgeon from, from uh, Latin America, Hugo Perez, who advised us and gave us a few uh, techniques on how to use peak, uh, peak brains. Obviously, it's not the same thing, but I think we can start there and hopefully walk our way up. You know, in, in, my very, um, in my very amateur reading about some of the early pioneers in neurosurgery, like Victor Horsley, Harvey Cushing, uh, or other surgeons like William Halstead, um, you know, work in the anatomy lab was uh, so important to them. Um, so um, here's some more numbers on this study. Um, uh, 40 patients went to each of the two groups, surgery or non-surgery, and they were pretty well matched. And uh, here's the meat of, of the results. Uh, in graph A, we see the percentage of patients without seizures over time on the x-axis. Those who underwent surgery had a dramatically uh, improved chance of being without seizures. Uh, is, uh, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty beautiful graphs. Would you agree? Yeah, uh, it boosts the agenda for children of um, epilepsy. And now it is extremely rare you know, in the published uh, literature. Um, there are some known complications that can be more frequent. And uh, these usually have to do with transient or permanent injury to uh, some of the uh, some of the visual fibers. Um, the other important thing is that we're uh, improving quality of life uh, and allowing some people to go back to work who otherwise uh, would be unable to work. Uh, but there are options for people who are not candidates for circuit resection and uh, these are also exerting techniques or um, are you aware if any of these are being done? I've heard of them yes but uh, about where they're done on the continent I'm not sure I'm not sure what they're done on the continent. Uh, a vagal nerve stimulator is something we don't really understand why it works but in about half of patients it uh, in improved seizure frequency by about half. Um, 
uh, when we do this on patients, we warn them about the risks of uh, vocal cord paralysis. Um, it's a, a fairly straightforward surgery that's pretty quick and uh, well tolerated though. Um, uh, we put these in on the left side of the neck. It's a device connected to a battery that has electrodes that uh, we loop around a little bit of the vagus nerve. And uh, um, here's a picture from uh, Roten's Atlas. Uh, are you familiar with the Roten? Um, yeah. With the Roten yeah. Picture? Yeah. It's a, it's a very good. Also available. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a new uh, app on your cell phone for some of the anatomy, and uh, now all North American U.S. neurosurgical residents are going to have to complete a basic examination in neuroanatomy as part of their junior residency, which is a, which is a, new, a new aspect of neurosurgery training in the US. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, and it, it's gonna feature heavily some of the pictures by Dr. Roden. Um, so, uh, you know, vagal nerve stimulation, so it's a whole topic. Um, you know, you could present on another time, um, but it, it's it's not perfect. Um, um, here's a question for you: What procedures are considered palliative, uh, or or rather, which one of these is not considered a palliative procedure? Do you know what palliative refers to? Uh. Yeah. So uh, the, the the only definitive treatment here, like causal treatment, is selective amygdalo hypocampectomy. Yeah. SAH. Yeah. Uh, very good. That's a good guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, you uh, you you're gonna be uh, uh, well well positioned there. Um. So earlier I talked a little bit about. Uh, data of, of taking out the whole anterior temporal lobe. There are also surgeons who advocate for doing what's called the selective amygdalo hippocampectomy, where you, you uh, leave a little bit more of other tissue and try to focus in on some of the deeper tissues. And uh, the published results show they have about comparable efficacy, and, and it may spare some of the neuropsychological changes that come from taking out the whole temporal lobe. Um, and uh, you know there are entire books uh, you know on these subjects that you can read if if you're interested. Uh, laser is a newer technology coming out in a lot of U.S. centers. Uh, is that something uh, that uh, you guys are seeing or um, uh, using in Great Britain? Um, well, 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 is crying. Um, so I, I was at the ground rounds at the uh, at the at the Brigham, and they they use this already, like um, the lit. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it was it um, pretty standard, or was is there controversy or um, discussion about it? Um, it it feels like they, they they do it already, like on they have a few criteria. Um, they spoke about having focal lesions and uh, uh, it was also about, I wasn't quite sure, it's like, like this one in which you can focus the laser therapy and then this one like that's like dispersed. So they're using one that's like focused right now. And they did it on one of the patients with multiple lesions and were able to align all the lesions in just one, one go. Oh, very nice. Uh, there's, a, there's an art, I think, to selecting the trajectory that uh, where you pass this very narrow probe stereotactically through a small burr hole in the skull in the operating room and you advance the probe down to your target depth and then it, while you're in the MRI scanner, um, you can obtain real time information about the temperature of the brain around the probe and then you can, you can raise the temperature around the probe and ablate tissue uh, and then you know, every few seconds, understand the temperature exactly that it's reaching. It's um, really uh, amazing MRI technology. 
if you can if you can watch a couple of those, I, I'd recommend it. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks. Uh, a big topic in the United States right now is how to reduce cost um, and uh, techniques that reduce hospital stay uh, are important. And another big topic in the United States right now is uh, narcotic use and pain medication. So surgeries in which patients require less pain medication uh, are getting a lot more interest. Um, yeah, this gives you a little bit of the idea of the explosion of interest in this field. Um, between 1985 and 2003, there was a six-fold increase in surgical procedures for epilepsy, and it dramatically more now. Here's a, uh, here's a picture from our operating room of how you might position a patient for temporal lobe surgery. Um, this, um, some of this equipment uh, includes the operating table, um, the anesthesia with the anesthesia machines, um, uh, the head being in a skull clamp. Uh, does anybody in the audience recognize this type of skull clamp? That, that, that's a, oh, Sujita. So, um, Dr. Shirak says Sujita. Yes, uh, Sugita. Sugita. Uh, Sugita uh, was a Japanese neurosurgeon who um, was a pioneer in, in, in refining neurosurgical tools um, for the neurosurgeon. And so he had a very seamless transition between the operating room and the engineering lab uh, to build some of the tools that he needs. And I think that's a marvelous approach for for designing what you need for your patients in your setting, you know, and um, um, if, uh, if tools that are used in North America are not ideal or cost prohibitive to, to a setting where you might be practicing, um, you know, I wonder if you could have some collaborations with uh, engineers to develop tools that are, are what you need in your setting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is, is, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's actually a good thing now that um, we equally have um, access to uh, markets like India uh, and Pakistan that do um, surgical equipment, and with like three D printing, they can equally do um, some of them if you have like the the right design. So you need to have an engineer, obviously. But I think that's definitely one of the ways to. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the shunt. Yeah, the shunt valve is, is a great example of that. You know, in the U.S., a shunt valve, they can charge several thousand dollars. Yeah, Shabra. Uh, uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, some clever pioneers have, uh, have developed a shunt valve that works almost as well. And uh, I believe the Shabra valve costs, is it $25? Um, yeah, ar around that. That's around, around the price, I think so and uh, has saved so many lives. Uh, and I, I think that type of thing could be done in a number of neurosurgical equipment areas. Um, um, let's see, um, here's a little bit about the actual surgery itself. Um, how are we doing for time? As much time as you want. Okay. Well, um, the, um, uh, it said if you get the chance to observe the anterior temporal lobectomy surgery, it's a, it's a great surgery to watch because uh, it incorporates uh, a lot of the tenets of neurosurgery, um, and planning the incision, uh, making the bony craniotomy, uh, taking the temperature we say, kind of uh, assess and feel how, how swollen the brain might be. Uh, does the patient need any, any, um, uh, Manitol or the head raised or the CO2 lowered to reduce the fullness of the brain so that you can open the dura. Um, you need to go in uh, with a plan about how much uh, you're going to plan to resect uh, and then be ready to measure that, uh, whether it's dominant side and you're going to go for four or five centimeters or non dominant and you're going to go larger. Um, and uh, you're going to be operating adjacent to some very important vascular structures. And so you need to 
use very good surgical technique. Uh, a, a technique we call sub-peel technique. Um, um, here's another little bit of uh, anatomy from Roten's atlas. Um, and here we have uh, marked out an incision. Uh, usually we do kind of a reverse question mark uh, style here um, and uh, flap the skin forward. Um, in the approach, um, is anybody aware of some of the uh, some of the nerves that could be damaged in, in this approach? I'll give you a hint. Seats. Listen. Uh, the well, uh, branches of the facial nerve. Oh. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Let's see. If so somebody has a comment. Frontalis branch of facial from Dr. Chirac. Yes. Um, and uh, so there, there are a couple of subtleties to performing the surgery to give the patient the best you know, cosmetic uh, outcome after surgery. Um, and um, um, so, you know, Dr. Roten would, would want us to do the surgery very accurately uh, and safely and gently uh, performing it as little disturbance of, of the structures as we can. Um, and um, so there's a fat pad in which this nerve runs and try to advance that forward without disrupting the nerve. And then uh, we divide through the temporal muscle in a way that hopefully doesn't denervate the temporal muscle or cause atrophy after surgery. Um, uh, if you want to be a, a real micro surgical uh, wizard, you, you also want to pres preserve things like uh, branches of the temporal artery, the superficial temporal artery, and just give the scalp a maximum blood supply. So standing at the head of the bed, this is a little bit how it would look, the patient's feet extending down away from us. Um, we've made our uh, exposure and we have uh, the exposed cranium here and uh, we can make uh, several burr holes. Um, there, there's an artery that comes uh, very near to this burr hole. I, uh, I suspect uh, many of you all have seen that before. Any clues? Uh, uh, Ulrich? Are you there, Ulrich? Uh, he may have may have some bandwidth issues himself. Hello, uh, Ulrich. Yeah. Uh, so, um, when, you're, when you're making a burr hole here, uh, you you may see the middle meningeal artery you know, in the dura. And uh, I just bring that up uh, for some of your medical students. Uh, that's a common question on some of the shelf exams is, you know, what blood vessel might be responsible for an epidural hematoma if somebody were, say, hit, hit by a softball or um, in that part of the head. Um, here's what it look, looks like after the skull is taken. It's time to uh, ensure that we have the correct enemy. Is there a comment? Uh, no, you can go ahead. It's good. Um, um, the um, and and again, we're standing at the head of the bed, kind of looking towards feet here, and we've got this temporal lobe kind of at the top of the surgical field. Um, um, Here's how it looks a little bit um, during the actual uh, lobectomy. Um, these photos are a little bit difficult to see, but uh, uh, basically the surgeon here is uh, removing brain tissue, but preserving you know, one of the layers of the, of, around the cortex. Clarity. Uh, uh, because the PIA is vital for survival, but the PIA gives you a very nice boundary to protect you from going into other vital structures on the other side of it. Um, during these approaches, we typically uh, encounter a vein, um, uh, and that vein is the sphenoparietal sinus. Um, and 
uh, I want to emphasize that uh, anatomy, uh, a good anatomist will always be a requisite for being a, a safe surgeon. So even to your audience who, who may not have the availability to learn how to do the laser interstitial therapy this year or um, stereotactic electrode placement, they can become experts on the anatomy using some of the resources online. Um, uh, here are some views of, um, of the structures that, that are resected in the temporal lobectomy. Inferior temporal lobe, uh, yeah, inferior temporal gyrus, the middle temporal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus. Um, and here we're taking different, different sagittal slices. Um, um, then when we get over here, this is a, a good way to see the hippocampus, which is part of what we're trying to resect, and the amygdala. Um, are these structures that you've been able to see before? Yeah, we had a, we, we've had a few lectures on this recently. Yes. Good. I, I've always struggled with it because it, you know, the, the color is the same. And, um, the functionality is so diverse, but uh, you know, on the appearance in cadavers, it, it doesn't stand out as much. And so um, you really have to study some of these things and see it, see it live to, to really internalize it. Um, the, uh, as I said, there's just a wealth of, of great anatomy here, including um, you know, around the temple horn and uh, the choroid plexus and the inferior choroidal point. Um, choroid point is useful because it um, it is where the anterior choroidal artery um, enters the choroid plexus. I guess we're all in with, right? Can you guys hear? Or is it just me? Can you want too much uh, detail here? But um, this surgery is um, it becomes tricky in this area because you need to know how far to go and um, when to stop, and that that's where the anatomy comes in. Um, okay. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, have you ever heard the expression temporal neocortex? Uh, uh, never. Uh, so, you know, in, in this surgery, we talked about the temporal neocortex as distinguished from the older parts of the cortex. And the temporal neocortex has the six layer cellular structure um, versus the older, more or considered more primitive uh, structures of the brain that have fewer cell layers in the cortex. Um, and um, so, so when you read about removing the temporal neocortex you know, in the chapters on how to do the surgery, that's, that's what it's talking about. Um, um, and, um, there's just a wealth of anatomy here that uh, can be mastered later. Um, and, um, you know, it, and then this can also lead you into uh, exploration of the components of the limbic lobe, uh, the hippocampal formation, uh, cingulate, olfactory cortex. Um, and so as you, as you can see, when you're doing this surgery, you're, you're involving different uh, 
uh, you know, different categories of structures that uh, are thought to have uh, um, kind of uh, I, uh, kind of thought thought to have different um, you know obviously have different functions, but maybe different levels of complexity in terms of the the biological uh, evolution. Uh, um, I, as I said, I, I, I love the history of neurosurgery and uh, I'm training at a place that was founded by somebody who had trained with Wilder Penfield. Um, and uh, Wilder Penfield is the surgeon who made the Montreal Neurological Institute a very famous place in the mid 20th century. And he popularized the surgery. Hey, have you heard of him? Um, yes, especially with the instruments and uh, the the homunculus. Yes. Exactly. Homunculus, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, that's one of his most cited papers. Um, and so when he would do these surgeries, he would uh, do a very wide craniotomy, bigger than the one that I showed you, and uh, which afforded an opportunity to do some electrical stimulation along the way and make important discoveries. This was uh, an important paper that he published on the topic. So this is, this is just to remind you that uh, nothing about this is very new. This has been around for um, 75 years. Um, and uh, that's a very frequent thing that I encounter in neurosurgery, writing a paper or learning something where uh, we think that we're on the cutting edge of some discovery and it turns out somebody has already uh, discovered that a hundred years ago <laughs> or longer. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so it's interesting that much of the same surgery we do today is, is the same type of surgery that was described by him, you know, in 1950, things like closing the air holes with Horsley's bone wax. Uh, I, I briefly mentioned Victor Horsley, um, but, but uh, he's um, somebody worth worth reading about. Um, so um, after the lobectomy, this is a little bit what we might be looking at. Um, I'm also always uh, so impressed at um, some of the earlier illustrations before the digital age. Um, often the surgeons would draw themselves. That's, that's very impressive. Uh, and they probably did it from memory. Um, so the, the hippocampus you know, is so named because it has the seahorse horn shape uh, in the coronal view. Uh, you, you probably knew that. Um, and uh, for a small structure, it has a, a well-studied anatomy of its own. Uh, and here's the collateral sulcus here more laterally, which helps you recognize it. And then the hippocampal gyrus and uh, these different layers of cells in the hippocampus. Um, the, the regions of the hippocampus are divided into uh, regions named CA1, CA2, CA3, CA4, I believe. Um, does anyone know where that terminology came from? Uh, no, no. Um, or, or why I've put up this rather, this perhaps shocking image of a uh, ram-horned man. Is, is that for Capricorn? I say Medusa. Uh, Medusa? No? Uh, no. Uh, let's see. I think somebody has a comment here. Oh, Amon's horns. Yes. Um, you know, in the pre-Roman times, there was a god um, in, in the Mediterranean culture named Ammon. Um, and uh, thought to have uh, two ram's horns. And uh, I think some of the early anatomists recognized the similarity of the, 
shape of the hippocampus uh, with the horns and uh, referred to it as cornu aminus. Um, I think someone has a comment there. Yeah. Uh, cornu aminus, yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, I, I believe the... Um, I believe the main, one of the biggest temples to this god was uh, in, in Thebes um, and uh, in North Africa. Um, um, so here's a little bit of a vision of hippocampal sclerosis might look like. <clears throat> um, and uh, here's another image of where those areas are, CA1, CA2, CA3, CA4, cornea aminus, and then the dentate gyrus. Uh, for the students in there, um, I've seen this question come up several times on the exams, um, but uh, CA1 is generally the most vulnerable to hypoxia. Um, I can't tell you exactly why that's important, but it seems to be a frequently asked question. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, again, um, I am far from being expert in anything. Um, I'm very much uh, in, still in the early learning phases of neurosurgery. And a lot of very smart people uh, have described all of this anatomy, and fortunately, most of it's available online. Um, um, the, um, it, it can be difficult to visualize in three dimensions. And so, you know, if you have the opportunity to go to anatomy lab or watch the actual surgery, there's nothing that can replace that. Um, um, so, um, let's see, uh, sh shall I continue on or are we, um, you know, I think we are, should pick it up another day. Whatever you want to do, Doc. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we, uh, can we um, circle back to thinking sure. about... Sure, that would be fine. That would be fine. Uh, uh, so, uh, Ulrich, um, you, you seem to have tremendous exposure to many countries, neurosurgery in many countries. Um, what are some strategies you, that you see as the most promising for being able to bring uh, some functional procedures to, to uh, some of the low and middle income countries? Or do you think that it's, uh, or, or do you just feel like it's an overwhelming task right now? Um, I, I definitely don't think it's an overwhelming task. And I think um, in the next few years, it's going to be, uh, people are going to demand demand to have this functional neurosurgery actually is happening. Um, I remember I was in uh, DR Congo and we had a patient who came in. She'd been having uh, uh, intractable epilepsy for, for years and she came in with her husband and she wanted a definitive solution. And they clearly stated that they wanted surgery, but we couldn't offer the surgery. So uh, with more internet, with more smartphones out there, people are demanding for it. So the neurosurgeon will have to adapt to that. And what I believe can help is definitely the fact that uh, we need to bring down the costs um, it's being cheaper and cheaper more um, um, out there. We can definitely uh, build cheaper um, equipment for functional neurosurgery and stereotactic neurosurgery as well because of the chips and, and the graphic parts and all that. And I think it's up to us to actually push, to actually push the to work with people that can help us have the, the cheaper equipment. Yeah. So Dr. Shirai says, yeah. that, sorry, Dr. Shirai says, I think epilepsy surgery is still quite feasible, but have more logistic cost related and equipment issues with uh, DBS and SCS. Yeah. yeah Dr. So, Dr. Harrison, um, well, Dr. Harrison, this is kind of related to that. What, what's the basic equipment that a functional, good functional neurosurgeon would need? What's the yes. basic, what would you say the baseline is 
for a facility to have good functional neurosurgery? What would you say is the basic equipment? Uh, well, the, uh, CT, obviously, and, uh, MRI and, uh, and microscope. Or, yeah, yeah, an MRI. MRI technology is very exciting. I've, I, I'm aware that several companies are experimenting with a low, low Tesla MRI uh, that, that may be much less expensive and maybe almost even portable um, that could open up uh, this tremendous number of possibilities. Uh, how many MRI machines are there in Cameroon? Do we know? Um, yeah, actually, we we did a, a study on that recently with with the uh, with other guys in the group. So we came up with the numbers for MRIs and CT scans. MRIs we are at eight currently all through the country, but almost all of them are in two cities. That's the capital city Yaoundé, as well as the economic capital Douala. But but things are improving um, compared to five years ago. It, it, it's a, uh, it's improving definitely. Yeah. How about as far as microscope, microscope, operative microscopes? Uh, is that something a, a good functional uh, surgeon would need? And, and in Africa, do many centers have it or do they need a microscope? Yes, well, yeah, microscope is necessary. Um, I think uh, I've, I've been to Kenya before and, uh, you know, I, you know, their microscopes have been around enough that I know uh, there are different generations available and the cost has come down for, especially for some of the previous generations of scope. Okay. Do most big centers have them in Africa? Uh, Ulrich, do you know the microscope operator? Um, the WFNS has done a great job um, uh, providing refurbished microscopes, usually the, the older generations. Obviously, they don't have the fancy options like mouthpieces and and all that, or maybe the possibility for a second a person cost, to be. Right? It's a million dollars for a good functional, a good operative microscope. Yeah, but th th those are the high end ones. I mean, you can okay. still get decent operative results with the, with, with the older generations. And I think that's where we need to start. We need to start there and then um, ourselves, hopefully design microscopes that can, uh, that, that, they, that better suit our, our context. Okay, they are getting less expensive, the microscopes. The older generations are getting less expensive. The newer ones, no. Okay, they're getting refurbished in most places. Yeah, that's, what they yeah. start, that's what they start with, right? Yeah, you, you, that's, what, that's basically what you start with. I think, um, you know, one, one thing that's, I think, even much more apparent today is the need for collaboration with other specialties. Oh, uh, yes, uh, yes. You know, in the old days, we have a tendency to idolize, uh, you know, individual surgeons like Harvey Cushing or Wilder Penfield. Um, but uh, even Wilder Penfield wrote a book called No Man Alone, mm. uh, referring to the importance of building, uh, of building a, a very large group. And, uh, you know, while Penfield, you know, did surgery, I think, Part, part of his great legacy was the leadership he exercised in bringing all those different people together uh, to do this. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and even to, to, to substantiate to that, there was an article recently of um, um, some, some neurosurgeons and residents who uh, designed uh, a cheap microscope, that, not for operating, but for, for practice. And it, it was basically... Uh, a smartphone camera uh, together with um, a few like a box in which you could you could use which you could use to practice your microsurgical skills so I think that there's a few options like that that can you can replace a lab a more a more expensive lab so that when you when your residents um, get to use these microscopes they're more used to because another problem is in the big in the bigger centers where they're micros um, whether microscopes or endoscopes or like high-end equipment, sometimes it's it's difficult for the consultants to let the residents um, practice on them because they've cost they've cost a lot of money or they they didn't cost money but 
it will be difficult to replace them. So they're not, they're not very comfortable giving the opportunity to the residents to use them straight away. So um, we, we, we should definitely think about solutions um, of how to, um, to curb that. You know, going, going along with that, uh, Ulrich, uh, yeah. today, today a neurosurgical resident in Africa, where do they get hands-on uh, orientation to the microscope um, if they don't have one at their facility? Do they go to a big city center or what, what do they do? Uh, you, you, be, you, you have to, you have to uh, put in a lot of effort and, and try to get into courses all across the world. I think, I think that's what Dr. Kabulu, for example, does. Like um, when there's a, a, an interesting course in, in, in Turkey, he would go and other residents are, are doing it. Unfortunately, you, you don't usually get finance, financing from funding from your institution. So it, it has to be out of, the, out of pocket, uh, which is a bit of an issue. Um, so you, you literally have to try and compensate and do it yourself, which is tough when you think about having to pay that on a on a, on an LMIC salary, that, that's very crazy. Yeah, it would be nice to yeah. have the, the companies like Storts involved with financing, training, using the microscope. It's good for their business. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I and that goes to show that goes to show that as a as a neurosurgeon, you you cannot just be thinking about operating. So you need to meet these people. You need to make friends with them. You need to think about how to help them get some money. And that, that goes with having a business pitch, um, pitch telling them, well, if we get more neurosurgeons, then we get more centers. If we get more centers, we get more operating microscopes and that's you, you're winning. So help us do this. Uh, yeah. And that's something that's been lacking for a while, but things are changing. Yes, Zolo. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Dr. Fraser. Yes. 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 Uh, Yes, doctor. I would like to know if, uh, if you, for example, do you know some neurosurgeons um, over there who maybe are ready or who are willing to, like, come into the uh, universities in Africa and uh, like give some courses to students, like from time to time they can come, like visiting lecturers and they give lectures to students on neurosurgery. Do you know some who are ready to do such thing? Maybe to organize like um, some sort of. Um, a campaign where neurosurgeons from uh, abroad, from over there, come and they give uh, lectures. Because here yeah, we don't really have, I can say in my faculty, we have had, we have only one neurosurgeon there and he's not, uh, he has a lot of work, so he has to be at the clinic and at the same time teach, so it's not really easy for him. So I'd like to know if you know some uh, neurosurgeons who are ready to like do the, the journey, come and teach and uh, something like that. Uh, yes, um, I think uh, the concept of global neurosurgery is is what you call a, a very hot topic right now. Um, I think there are a lot of people who would be very interested in doing that. Um, I think Just that organize. a lot of people who have done that. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. The, uh, oh, I, I've. Um, I've uh, talked a little bit with uh, Professor Kureshi in East Africa uh, about the Kasexa program, the College of Surgeons uh, of East, Southern, and Central Africa that, that uh, Ulrich mentioned earlier. And uh, they seem to be having some, um, some amazing uh, advances in neurosurgical training uh, by, by figuring out a good collaboration model with universities in other countries. Um, and uh, I've, I'm aware of several people who are, uh, have a similar vision for, for uh, Cameroon. And uh, I've, you mentioned one group that I, I'm going to go uh, read about, but um, there is a, a group called Brain Global, um, led by Francis Fazou, who is a Cameroonian um, physician uh, and uh, uh, I know he's uh, met with people at uh, at Harvard who have an interest in that as well. He said, uh, "I think I think the difficulty is not going to be finding people who are interested, but in developing a sustainable framework so uh, can support you not only 
for a couple of weeks, but you know, over the years and years of very hard training uh, that are that are required. Um, so, to 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 add to that, um, usually the difficulty is not about like like um, Dr. Henderson said, it's not about finding those people who are willing to 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 go there. Um, you have to be aware of the fact that there's a lot more to that. Um, for example, Zolo, you're in a medical school, so those things have to go through the dean. You, you need to get um, authorization from the dean, and then he has to go through maybe the local neurosurgeons as well. They have to have this thing that's, thing, that's saying that. So those things take time. However, I think one of the greatest invention in humanity, of humanity right now is the internet. You've got opportunities like neurosurgical TV, you've got um, neurosurgical atlas, upsurgeon, all those things help you to level the ground. Like you can train from Cameroon and still have the quality education that someone gets from Harvard or Johns Hopkins, wherever. So now the, the unfortunate thing is students don't have access to this information. And that's what we're trying to do with this group. That's a good like, point. Though, trying to, because, you yeah. know, it'd be nice to have a, a registry or, or kind of like, uh, you know, various groups going to Africa from Europe and the United States. There's one group from Valencia, Spain, that goes down to Zanzibar. Pablo Gonzalez has a group from Spain that goes down and teaches 3D and neuroanatomy. Mm. And they've been doing that for years. Uh, are you, is anyone aware, perhaps you are Dr. Henderson, of a registry of, of neurosurgical groups that go to Africa? I know there's another group from Belgium that goes to Uganda, but these are all spotty things that I've heard about, but don't see one area that has, you know, the listing of all the, Groups that go to Africa. Do you know? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there and, and there. Just in the last year or two, there are uh, dozens. I would say dozens of journal articles appearing. Um, you know, from some of the different groups. Uh, what is missing is a, a a big article that would tie everything together and kind of list everything. Yeah, that would be great. Um, that would be great. But, uh, there's you know, World Federation. The um, you know the World Federation of Neurosurgery, um, it, which is meeting right now in Beijing, it is a resource. The um, you know Duke University has a deep relationship in Uganda, uh, like you said. Uh, the Valencia has a deep relationship in Zanzibar. Um, the um, uh, there are relationships in Ethiopia and Tanzania. Um, Kyo Uganda. And, uh, Cure Uganda with Tony, Tony Manzar. Tony, uh, what's his last name? Manzara, is that his name? In Ethiopia, yeah. He's very active. But uh, I think, Zulu, th this is an exciting time for the Cameroon side. Um, I think people are trying to figure that out. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you send me an email, I can um, connect you to some people I've heard who are, who are talking about how that could be possible. Yeah, we'd like to we'd like to do our job and tie these groups together, or give give a central place where people can go to find out what's going on uh, in right. different parts of Africa from foreign groups that are coming there, giving courses like uh, Ulrich mentioned. Uh, you know, just having the knowledge of the courses offered, what's out there, what's out there now, because uh, mm -hmm. a lot's being done, but uh, a lot of it we don't know about. <laughs> uh, they just. Right. It would be nice to know, but maybe we well, can put I think that whatever, together. Whatever you do, you know, whatever you do, the important thing is is to get training. Is is to get excellent training. Uh, unfortunately, neurosurgery is not a field where um, where you can get a half half job training. Um, yeah. The uh, it requires a, a lot of time, a lot of. Uh, attention to detail, a lot of support and mentorship. And you know, until, until the program is up and running, in, uh, you may need to go to a different place right now to get that level of training if, if you want to do it and, and then uh, and bring it back. Yeah, going along with that, uh, Dr. Henderson, we're working now with, um, with Khalif in Nairobi, Kenya, to try to establish a, a virtual cadaver lab as you know, 
not anyone, not many people have access to cadaver labs, which of course is necessary in neurosurgery. Uh, but we're trying to work with them to televise uh, a cadaver lab, uh, which of course is better to be there yourself, but some people can't get to places like Nairobi or Cairo or whatever. So uh, we're, we're working on that. And hopefully we'll get stores yeah, yeah. involved. As you mentioned, it would be nice to have a, a company like that involved in promoting um, micro, you know, neuroanatomy and, and learning on the internet uh, if you can't get there. Uh, so hopefully that area will develop. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Ulrich can share you my email address and um, I'd be happy to brainstorm some ideas um, with you. Right? Yeah, any ideas that you have, Doc, we're willing to explore. So thanks for taking the time today. Uh, so, uh, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very humbling. Uh, you make me feel like a bad resident. Um, Ulrich, you're, you're more knowledgeable and more prepared. Um, and um, I think um, uh, it's, it's really great that you're doing this and um, that you're helping build bridges. Um, because as I think you said, uh, there are a lot of people who would love to help, help uh, you know, bring neurosurgery, functional neurosurgery to the areas that don't have it yet. Um, but it, it's gonna take some really good leaders to make it possible. And just to give you a little bit more encouragement, um, you know, when Wilder Penfield, you know, was in a very similar position when he established uh, the Institute in Canada, you know, and um, he had to exercise a lot of leadership, both politically and financially, in uh, going to groups like the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, who provided the money that was necessary to do it, uh, build partnerships. So I think you're, I think you're doing it. Well, uh, thank you, know, you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm f and thank you for, for for taking the time to 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 speak to to us. Um, I know the feedback is already very positive. And for those who were not able to be here, I know a lot of people are wanted to be here. The good thing is with this platform, we always um, post this um, video so that we can we, uh, we can always access them later on. And the talk was fantastic. I'm sure a few of them will be considering functional neurosurgery. Um, after neurosurgery as well. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Henderson. That was very, very nice. Okay, and we'll obviously, we'll John, make, we'll John thank you. I mean, you, you've been there from the from the start. Because I, I have to say this, um, uh, John gave us the platform. It was about maybe close to a year now, a few months. Um, and it's been great ever since. The, the group has just been growing. Uh, I remember when it was just like um, three of us. And now the group, the WhatsApp group is like 130 something people yeah. like from all of Africa and it's crazy. Um, thanks. Well, you know, Dr. Henderson, uh, you can see it's not a perfect platform and we're learning and we're making mistakes, but we're not afraid to make mistakes. Uh, I know what most American schools would not accept a, a transmission like this. However, we have to deal with low bandwidth issues in developing countries. Uh, and even in the States, sometimes you can't get to a good Wi-Fi connection. Uh, but we're not afraid. We'll make mistakes, and it's not going to be perfect. That's okay. That's okay. We're learning, and we'll be getting better. So, and we welcome you at any time. And we'll keep in touch by email. Whoop, as you can yeah. see. Okay. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.